joining us now is Oji Ope with stories trending around the world. Hello, Oji. Excellent. Hello. <laughs> you got it today. Okay. How are you? I'm good. Perfect. Good morning, good morning. Tundu. I've seen all the men. They're all gushing after you, Tundu. I'm so jealous. Uh, I am. You? <laughs> of course not. But I've told them we will call a family meeting in Abeokuta, and uh, we will have an interview session, and we will assess them. I see. Uh, well, Tundu, am I, am I right <laughs> or wrong? Rufa is the Correct biggest culprit. Right. Hello, Rufa. How are you? <laughs> Hello, Rufai. Hi, good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Very well. Perfect. Yeah. Well, good morning to you, viewers. We begin what's trending in Nigeria. A magistrate court in Lagos has freed a 16-year-old girl charged with murdering a 51-year-old man who allegedly <clears throat> tried to rape her. The magistrate, Philip Adebowale Ojo, struck out the murder charge filed by the police against a 16-year-old following advice from the Lagos State Directorate of Public Prosecution. According to police statements, the 51-year-old man, who was a security guard, was stabbed to death by the teenage girl at his residence in Lagos. The police say the teenager went to the house of the deceased on July 3rd to help him with some chores when he attempted to rape her, and in self-defense, she picked a knife and stabbed him to death. The court has established that she um, was innocent of the crime that they charged her with. I mean, not that she was innocent, that they established that she actually did it in self-defense. I'm very excited about this news, I mean. I think it's yeah. a good development. Yes, I think. And I think that the court uh, took an excellent position yes, in this matter. absolutely. <clears throat> Section 33 of the, uh, of the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria grants everybody the right to defend their lives and their property. And Section 32, Subsection 3 of the Criminal Code also recognizes the right to self-defense. And as it has been determined in Wankwegeya versus State, which is a 2005 case, the right to self-defense is a complete Absolutely. defense. Absolutely. It's complete in itself. Yes. So it's a message, this particular ruling, is a message to rapists. If you go and rape a woman or you harass a woman, you could be killed in the process and nothing, yeah. by the victim. Absolutely. And if you are killed, you are on your own. You are dead, you are dead. The family, everyone's So I don't know whether the case will go on appeal, but I will be surprised if any, I don't uh, see the state I mean, no, any, I don't any mean court, that, yeah. you know, reversing that, because the right to self-defense is a complete defense yeah. uh, under criminal law. Perfect. Rufai? If you go to rape somebody and you are killed, you just die for the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> Period. You die for fun. Point <laughs> blank. Very well said, Rufai. Well, still on rape issues in Nigeria, a report detailing 80 cases of rape in Anambra State during the lockdown has got many Nigerians on Twitter outraged. According to Nkechi Anazodo, the director of Child Welfare Service in the state's Ministry of Women Affairs, some of the cases were of fathers who raped their daughters during the lockdown. Ms. Anazodo added that in most of the cases, the fathers who raped their daughters threatened to kill them. She has now called for a statewide campaign to raise awareness in the 21 local government areas of the state. Well, let's take some reactions. One user wrote, there are many women in our nation today who have been victims of these demons at home. Many don't share the stories. I have personally spoken with over five of them. Many have repressed it, some normalized it, and others hate their families for covering it up, and some never shared. Another user wrote, in Sokoto alone, about 606 rape cases were reported in 2019. Just imagine the nationwide cases of those report, and also imagine those that were not reported. It's becoming an epidemic. Finally, user wrote, father-daughter is another level. What's going on in the minds of the fathers? And those blaming victims, will you say, will you still say she's wearing a short thing in, is the reason? Cost generation. Well, this last tweet really is my own question. I mean, what is this? Father, daughter, rape. I don't understand the it. The ultimate it's, abomination. It is the ultimate abomination. I mean, when I was reading some of the tweets, there were a lot of people that had some really 
derogatory comments, and I couldn't understand. About Most of who? them were rape apologists. They were saying, what is the relationship within the fa between the fathers and the daughters? I mean, why would the father rape the daughter? Some of them were calling it lies. This is a, a report that is absurd. It doesn't happen. I mean, I don't understand. And this is the culture. The rape culture is already accepted in Nigeria, because I'm seeing people saying fathers don't rape their daughters. I mean, I don't understand. So a woman would wake up and say, or a girl would say her exactly. father raped her because yeah. it makes her look good. Yes. Oh, I, don't, I don't understand what kind of ridiculous thinking that is. As far as I'm concerned, it is the ultimate abomination, but we have to really remember that school and work are such a refuge for certain people. Mm. During the lockdown, I was in the unfortunate position of having to call and send messages to a few people constantly. Are you OK? Because when you know certain people are vulnerable, and I'm talking, well, one of them was a man, to domestic violence. They go to work to just get peace. They go to school to get peace. Some children, because they're in the, in the lockdown, locked with their abuser, Absolutely. their assaulter. It was hell on earth, that lockdown period. And because of the general mood in some homes, when money is short, violence tends to rise. When people have maybe lost their job or they haven't been paid or they haven't been paid their full salary or they're anxious about where the next meal is going to come from, people take it out on their children. This is so grim and it's depressing. Well, quickly, I, one, <clears throat> we're dealing with two issues here that has been reported by the director of welfare services that you quoted. One is rape, then the other is incest. And both, of course, within our cultural context, uh, do not make sense. Uh, they, you know, they're generally condemned. But I think what you should worry more about is the culture of silence around rape. Because rape is stigmatized in our environment. So we may not, never have the correct statistics. We will never. What which you just is told the point. You, you know, because people don't want to report rape yes. uh, out of this fear that the de destiny of a woman in life uh, particularly, is to end up in a man's house and be a married woman. So many families will never report. So whatever numbers we're coaching are incorrect. But the culture of silence is something that we have to address. People need to be educated. Civil society groups, NGOs, the media need to get into it to conscientize people, to realize that, look, rape is an act of violence that's, against that's the human person, and that every human person within the Constitution, has a right to dignity. It's a violation of that person's dignity. It's an abuse, and it's been criminalized in existing laws. Now, you may argue that the laws are inadequate in terms of punishment or how you provide the uh, proof of evidence or you argue the burden of proof, but at the same time, you know, people must just be aware that if you rape somebody, you have committed a crime, and that the victim has a right to report immediately. You know, so this is the issue. And then, of course, in the long term, we need to take a second look at the enabling laws with regard to rape. Those laws are defective. But it's yes. as OG the said, even with this kind of issue, there were yeah. people posting tweets blaming the victims. This is why people are silent. Uh, yeah, that's why we, we need to educate it people. Is yeah, that know. is the sensitization, yeah. especially the young girls who are even afraid to report yeah. the cases. So that's, be yeah, that's one of the issues. Rufai, what's your take on this? I mean, three things I'll say. Number one, please, if anybody rapes you, don't let them beg you in the name of God to, to, to remove the case and stop the case. Do not collect money from them. I've had a mother of a rape victim that collected 20,000 naira to stop the case because the person has a family relative. Please do not collect money. Do not stop the case. Let the law take its full course. You can still forget, forgive somebody after the person has gone to jail for their actions. Well, once you collect money, that's no longer rape. It that's has no, become prostitution. It's become prostitution. So Cash please, for sex. So please, Trade by butter. please don't say because in the name of God we want peace to reign. The person can still go to jail and you still forgive the person after the person has gone to jail. It has to be said. I don't think it's prostitution at all. I don't see rape as sex. Uh, once you collect money. No. No, rape you, is are, not you are sex. selling no, something. No, rape is an act of violence. It's like saying if I murder somebody with a hoe, I'm farming. No, it is a murder. It's violence. <laughs> no. It's the same thing as collecting blood money. In certain cultures, it happens. No. Some people collect think, money when think, their uh, relative has been murdered. Rufai's point should be taken conjunctively. And no, not but we have to use the right terminology. Rape and no. sex are two different no, things. No, we all agree that rape is evil, is criminal, 
But it is not say, do, do not collect money. Yes, I'm not talking about don't collect money. I'm not talking Once about don't collect money. Once a woman collects money, you are already selling finish, your body. So, so. May I finish? I'm not talking about don't collect money. I'm talking about likening rape to prostitution. Rape is not about but sex. I never rape said is an act of violence. If you collect money after you've been raped, you have given that you've let the perpetrator off the hook. And yes, in the same way that when people are murdered, like um, Khashoggi was murdered and his children collected blood money, it's done in certain cultures. People collect blood money. That does not mean a murder did not occur. A murder occurred. They've collected money and let the guilty person off the hook. That I need to clarify. It's, got, it's not prostitution. Very, very well said. Too. No, I never why, said why, rape why, is prostitution. Why I said that is because maybe because of the economic status of those people, some people have offered money and say, okay, let's just forget the case. As paltry as even twenty thousand. No, and you're no, right no, to say that. No amount of money. I'm just saying, money. is that prostitution word? I don't. That no not amount of money should be collected. The person should Indeed. go to jail. Indeed. They should face the full rot of the law, even if the person is your pastor. Indeed. Very well said, guys. Shall we take another story? Sure. Still in Nigeria. Any woman that collects money for sex. Rape uh, is not sex. Rape is an act of violence. I, no, I never said rape is uh, prostitution. Okay, we should move on. <laughs> Collecting money for rape is sex in exchange for money. It's two different things. It is. Okay. Still People in Nigeria. Give sex and collect money. <laughs> Dr. Bati, <laughs> shall we take our next story? Yes, please? let's take it. Thank you. Well, still in Nigeria, the governor of Cross River State, Ben Ayade, has unveiled no fewer than 300,000 personal protective equipment to be distributed to school children as the state prepares to open some schools next week. The personal protective equipment, including face shields, overalls and gloves, were produced at the state-owned garment factory. In a statement on Wednesday, the governor disclosed that the protective gears will be given out for free at public schools and that medical personnel in the state will also be given PPEs for free. The governor urged the federal government to encourage schools to reopen and to adopt a new system that will integrate coronavirus as part of the nation's lifestyle. Well, first, I'd like to congratulate um, Professor Ben Ayadi. I think he's making good strides in his state. His state still has no record of COVID-19. But, I mean, I don't know about this reopening of schools. I mean, we've seen cases in South Korea where schools were reopened and the kids were infected. So the spike of uh, coronavirus uh, happened. And I, I think that, you know, it's not a good idea at this point to reopen schools at all. It happened in Israel as well. Yes. I mean, he, he quoted China. He said, in China, we've seen cases. And it, it was really, really difficult for... It's really difficult for the uh, uh, school to manage this whole system of coming in with your protective gears and doing the uh, social distancing and all of that. It's really difficult. I don't see any reason why the students cannot continue to do their virtual education, even for a whole year. I really am a parent that is advocating for this I school guess it would depend on the parents as well. Like in the UK, schools yeah. reopened and a lot of parents just ignored that. So yes. parents need to feel confident and comfortable sending their children to school. Also in the UK, there were a few cases where schools had to, schools that opened had to shut down again because teachers had been infected with COVID-19. Yes. There should be no rush where this is concerned. I totally yes. agree with you. I don't see any reason why <clears throat> schools should be Well, I think we should learn point. from the example of Israel. Yeah. Three weeks ago, Israel reopened schools, and then there was a sudden spike in the uh, rate of infections with pupils and staff, and Israel has had to reverse itself. And it is also true that in the United Kingdom, the plan to reopen schools on Monday was rejected, uh, not just by the uh, uh, teachers' unions, but also by uh, many schools. And the uh, United Kingdom is now thinking of how to provide for students lagging behind uh, in summer, you know, during the summer holidays, to see how they can keep up. But, okay, what uh, most people say is that you can't keep everything on a lockdown uh, permanently. But I think every country, every state should look at its own peculiar circumstances before it takes any decision one way or the other. We may well have a situation in Nigeria when if you say schools should reopen, many parents uh, may not agree. No, I would. You wouldn't. talked about virtual education. Yes. It's not, if you look at the computer penetration rate in Nigeria, it's not really every student that has access to a laptop. Maybe if you are attending a private school, it's possible. 
if you belong to a middle class family, it's possible. But the majority of students fall into the underprivileged, disadvantaged And then the country category. should provide. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a time for extraordinary measures. And the, the country should provide computers for public schools as well. Well, even at the federal level, you brought the story about Christopher. The yeah. Minister of State for Education uh, a few days ago at the briefing had made the point that, look, they're still studying the situation. Yeah. And they will do a review and then make appropriate uh, recommendations. But we should not rush because most parents will not want their children to be put at risk. All right. Rufai, what's your take? I mean, uh, on a lighter mood, while you guys were talking about reopening in Cross River State, uh, a word keep coming, kept on coming to my head that says, masquerade, please be careful, you are going to the expressway. <laughs> and let's all be careful. Let's do this very cautiously this period. It's a good development. To have a lot of PP and face mask, but please let's be cautious because COVID is a very tricky virus. You might take all the precautions and still get COVID. You'll be shocked. You don't even know where you got it from. It's true. Very true. It's a very tricky virus. Very tricky. But, I mean, for Cross River State, the fact that they have not reported any COVID-19 case, I mean, I think it might be okay for them to reopen some schools like the governor has. You assume that the no-case situation is well, the correct the situation. That's the record. That's an uh, assumption. That, that's the it record at true. this point. You're correct. A lot of people, and he's come under fire. A lot of people are saying that they're not testing in the state. So, you know, who knows? But the record still says that uh, Cross River has... No case of COVID-19 at this point. Well, let's take another story in Nigeria. Some residents of Ondo State have commissioned a road that was left in a deplorable state. The residents on their community called Ilaje Advancement Forum claimed that the road was abandoned by the governor of the state, Rotimi Akiridolu. In a now viral video, the chairman of the community said they chose to commission the road because they realized that the governor has been very busy. Well, let's take a listen. We said the Almighty God will reward you according to your hard work. We hereby commission this beautiful project. Okay. On behalf of the Ondo State Government, we at the Elijah Investment Forum, we recognize the fact that the governor is very busy. He has been busy signing MOU. For that wise, we thought it necessary to commission this project for the use of mankind and the entire Federation. In Jesus' name we commission. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a protest that has gone on another level. I, I mean, I must commend these people. This is completely hilarious. I mean, the comments on social media have been amazing. I mean, I must commend these people. I mean, this is the only way to show the situation. Look at the roads. I mean, it's ridiculous at this point. This, I think, is the perfect way to get yes. their hands across. <laughs> but it's sad for the governor to be lampooned during a re-election campaign in yeah. this fashion, and I hope he well, addresses Some people this. are saying that's what it is. Yeah, he, he has to address this because it does not look good. You're yeah. asking people for their votes, and, you know, these are the roads. But do you know if it's a state or federal road? Because I do know that there's been that argument in the past, yeah. that the states, when they do... Um, repair federal roads, they might not get their money refunded to them. Right. The federal government true. did approve money to Ondo State recently, but if you were not given permission before you repaired the road, you will not be refunded. So sometimes states are caught between a rock and a hard place. Yes, well, I don't know, but it appears that he had already started working on the road, apparently, and he stopped. So that's the conversation on Twitter right, right now. Well, the thing is that it's election time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the gubernatorial election in uh, Undo State is in uh, October, October 10. Yeah. The primaries will be held in July. And as election approaches, you find all kinds of permutations. And even in the um, uh, All Progressive Congress Party that uh, Governor Akire Dulu belongs to, um, there's also a faction. There's what is called the Unity Group. And there's a lot of infighting within that party. So. We may be dealing, at one level, with propaganda. Secondly, uh, there will be no justification for any state, any community, either Ilaje or Okitupupa or whatever, to have that kind of road that was shown. Uh, look at it. That's not a road. <laughs> and in many parts of Nigeria, that is what you find. That's what we find. There is the crisis of infrastructure, infrastructure deficit. 
governors, state governments, federal government not delivering to meet the expectations of the people. And it's not just about roads, it's also about other sectors of our lives. Well, the people who did this, I would like to congratulate them Absolutely. on their creativity. <laughs> this is a very excellent demarketing uh, strategy right. and a way of protesting. Because what we see ordinarily is that government commissions completed roads, completed infrastructure. But here you find uh, a terrible road, totally unmotorable, uh, being commissioned. And the video has been going uh, viral. So, uh, Governor Akere Dulu should not get angry. I think he should uh, uh, take special notice of this. And, and within the time available possible. to him, right. he can still attend to it. And, and I would like to it. see him go yes. and commission Correct. the same road, Absolutely. if it is possible, yes. to say, look, we have done the road. You have protested, we have done it. Yes. But naturally, as a politician, he will say this is the work of the enemy. He shouldn't interpret it that way. Before we take a Twitter re reaction, uh, Rufai, do you have a comment? Uh, I am not surprised at things happening like this because I am from Ogun State. And uh, we once had a past governor that thrived on commissioning roads that have not been done. There's a road from Shagamu to my village in Odogolu that was said to have been dualized. But one part of the road was done. The other part is just pure bush. <laughs> so I am not surprised at things like this. It just shows the same democracy that the likes of MQ Abiola died for. Absolutely. Well, you will get a chance to talk at plenty tomorrow about MQ Abiola Rufai. Yeah, tomorrow is <laughs> And I look forward to day. that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's take a reaction on the story. Uh, one user wrote, it's time Nigerians start holding their stage state governors and local government chairmen to account for poor local infrastructures. They get allocations from the federal government monthly. Besides settling their political demon fathers, start asking, where does the rest go? I mean, that is completely apt. This is what people should continue to do, I think. I, I think everyone should do this for all the state roads at this point. Maybe this is the only way to call attention. Name and shame. Name them. and shame. I am so happy. Well, let's take another story. Anti-racism protests have continued to gain momentum across the globe. In South Africa, the economic freedom fighters held a nationwide protest against the murder of George Floyd on Monday. In a now viral video, Julius Malema, the leader of the party, reminded black South Africans that they cannot be talking about Black Lives Matter if they are xenophobic towards their fellow Africans. Let's take a listen. Why do you kill Zimbabweans? Mozambicans, Nigerians, Somalians here yeah, in South Africa and calling them Makwere Kwere and calling them all sorts of names. Today you hold a placard and say Black Lives Matters when you support the killing of your own fellow black brothers and sisters here yeah, in South Africa and have some useless a hashtag on social media put South Africa first. That is a narrow nationalism because a problem of black people is not a problem of South Africa. A black man is hated everywhere, be it in China, be it in France, be it everywhere. You cannot say South Africa first. We must say black first. I'm so proud of Julius. He's such so a well freedom said. fighter. So I love well him. Said. He's been doing this for years now. I mean, more, but, but during this protest, he even went further. He attacked the president of South Africa. He actually called him a bastard at this point. Yes, and that's how vocal he has been with this whole protest. He was accusing the president that, you know, he's only providing security for white people in South Africa. And because of that, there's a, a trending hashtag, Julius must fall at this point in South Africa, because some people thought that he took it too far. But I mean, I really appreciate men like this. I do too. I don't yeah. like the name calling. Yeah. That's really not on. Right. But I appreciate him because even in the height of the xenophobic attacks, right. he was vocal yes. even then. So he's taken a really responsible role in this situation. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I think the thing about Julius Malema of the Economic Freedom Fighters of South Africa is one is consistency. Yes. Two, the fact also must be noted that we seem to have in South Africa uh, a stronger, more vocal more qualitative opposition. And 
on many occasions in the past, either before elections or after elections, you see members of the Economic Freedom Fighters in Parliament uh, taking very radical positions on issues. Now, if you compare that to what we have in Nigeria at the National Assembly, uh, which people currently describe as a rubber stamp assembly, you don't see the same kind of uh, energy, the same kind of uh, proactiveness, and I think that that is more, most unfortunate. Now, the third point about what you were saying about Black Lives Matter is, again, about internationalization. Yesterday, I described it as a cultural revolution around the emerging martyrdom of uh, George Floyd, because, you know, what is being complained about across the world. Only yesterday, I think in uh, the United States, Christopher Columbus' uh, <laughs> A statue was brought down. Was the, the, before it was brought the down, generals, was beheaded the, in some the generals, it, though. The generals of he the uh, Confederate Army yeah. are also under threat. That there is threat to take down General Lee's uh, uh, statue. So you see that there's an international movement. Yes. And I, I hope that leaders, communities, persons will pay very close attention to the iconic, iconic message, uh, to the symbiotic message. Uh, uh, you know, a semiotic message that is being put across about the fact that when you don't allow justice, yes. you could create a current of revolution uh, beyond even your own boundaries. Yes, but since you brought up the issue of statues, my own take on that is that now that these statues are being brought down, they should be replaced by freedom fighters like, you know, Mandela, Malcolm X, and, and all of these people. That's my take on that. Rufai. Right. Uh, very well said. But I want to say this uh, in relation to what Julia Ma Julius Malema has said, uh, the fact that blacks are killing fellow blacks. But I want to refer you to the words of a man called Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon said, and I quote, that oppressed people will oppress others. So black people need to move away from the mentality of oppression that makes them oppress other black people. And it has to be said that we need to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Well, you I should love that. attribute that, that quote. You, you, should, should, you didn't attribute that slavery. Quote, you should place that quote with uh, Paulo Freire in uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And what he says about the psychology of the oppressed. But we don't have much time, yes. right? 